Hello everyone. Uh, one thing to note, they are going to take some pictures at some point. It's going to be a surprise when they do it, but they have to do the flash because I guess the lighting isn't uh, good enough. So if you see a little flash, uh, don't worry, uh, it's not the fire alarm. Um, and yeah, if, if there's going to be a problem with that, you know, please let the um, photographer in the back know. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about scheduling with paper mill. I think the title on the talk is a little bit longer. It couldn't fit in the slides, but essentially it boils down to this uh, uh, scheduling notebooks uh, with this new technology. Um, uh, as it kind of already presented, I'm Matthew Seal. Uh, my background started in machine learning and slowly transitioned into data and then architecture and sort of this kind of melding of this space, which is a perfect fit for scheduling notebooks because the whole goal is to make those uh, spaces closer together. Um, yeah, and so at Netflix, we've started adopting notebooks everywhere. Um, and there's sort of this open question of, well, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> and uh, we're at JupyterCon here now, but you know, back a year ago, even two years ago, you know, this was kind of an absurd thing that to talk about. It's like, well, they're really useful for like this machine learning or something, but well, why would you use it for other things? Um, and I think as the tools have come along, um, and the users have expanded that we, that we want to be addressed. Uh, notebooks have become more and more viable and more and more uh, desired. So uh, in one place where we kind of started the story was we at Netflix were looking at what's our future data users going to be. Um, in particular, Netflix is expanding a lot on their content side. So we have lots of analysts and um, people who are semi-technical but not programmers who want need to be able to ask the same questions that other people can access that are programmers. Um, and so the barriers to entry we had were, were higher for those users, and we didn't want to build a whole new set of tools for those users that are different than the tools we use on the uh, data side of the world. Um, so really kind of what's a common interface between these users, what's something that could grow into that interface. Um, and we landed at, at notebooks, and it really, because it answered some of these like fundamental questions we had. In particular, um, you know, we want to know for, for our data analysts, for our data engineers, for our machine learning developers, for our programmers, uh, for our content analysts. All these different user groups all have this common need. They need to ask questions about our data. They need to form either uh, you know, output data as a result or report to the result or some sort of um, you know, artifact that they can use to have a discussion or make a decision point. Um, and those decisions were, were, were hard to get to. And uh, yeah, we think that Notebooks are a really good answer to a lot of these problems. Even in places where they're not perfect yet for that user base, it's close enough that we can help like interact and contribute back to the open source community to get them across that line. So, um, you know, what attributes of notebooks made us choose this over something like, um, you know, other options that are out there? Uh, like Tableau is a really common reporting layer, but it's not so great when you want to use it for, say, transporting data or um, you know doing something that isn't a visual report. So the aspect of notebooks came in really is one, they're highly shareable. It's easy to share a notebook link and have somebody else look at the out the outcome. They're really easy to read. Um, they're designed to be like you know segments of logical units that you can interpret. Um, their outputs can be featured as reports, which is something that I think notebooks have been getting better at, like better visuals, the ability to hide the code, um, new UIs that, that give a, a nicer experience. And they're familiar to many of these user groups already. Many of them already contributed or already work in the notebook space. Um, and for users that are more advanced, it's multi-language, like you connect a kernel that runs just about anything. So um, you're not going to limit future use cases. So Netflix is making a strategic bet on this. Uh, we think that this will be our common interface for our users. And uh, we're investing a lot in the infrastructure and in deploying like, shareable analysis and tools in this space. Um, and we're doing this to the point where we're moving all 10,000 of our ETL jobs on the notebooks. Um, and these run um, over 100,000 queries a day uh, on our big data system. So all of these are moving the notebooks. Not all the users know they're running on a notebook, but um, many of them do, and it's, it's actually been an interesting and fun journey. So uh, one thing we, want, we need to dig into first before we talk about scheduling is we need to talk about um, notebooks, in particular, like changing around the things that are challenging in notebooks and making them beneficial. Um, so one of the things, if you, if you think about notebooks and how they're iterative documents that you're working on, it might be a little crazy to think, well, you're going to rely on this to be correct and running the way you expect every time. Like, aren't notebooks this highly mutable thing? Um, and the, the answer is traditionally yes. Notebooks, 
they, the good things they have is they have quick iteration cycles. Um, they're recording the outputs right next to the code, so you have one document. Um, they're easy to modify. The bad thing is they're easy to modify, <laughs> and they have a, a, a lack of history, at least in, in most systems. So you, you kind of have a problem where, what did I do last week versus this week? What change did I make that broke my execution? Those are questions we get a lot. Or, hey, I deleted my notebook. It's super important. Can I get it back? <laughs> um, so, uh, and then there's some ugly things that, you know, the ecosystem is still working around, like concurrent edits or the browser holding all the state in, in certain situations that um, aren't as important to this talk, but are things that are improving. So uh, production gaps we wanted to fill. Things we wanted to keep, results link to code, really good. Visuals, really good. Easy to share, awesome. Um, but, but some of the things we, you know, were missing from this previous picture was uh, we want, we don't have version notebooks, we want some sort of you know, instance of versioning. We want the mutable state to sort of go away in the production execution context. Um, and we want to be able to templatize these things. We don't want to have to write a notebook for every single job. We want one notebook that can be reused in lots of ways. Um, so this is where the library that we're going to talk about the most is, which is Paper Mill. This is a, an Interact library. Interact, by the way, is it, uh, an open, open source uh, repository, which has a bunch of small projects in the Jupyter ecosystem that uh, contribute in different ways. Um, and some of the talks later, we'll kind of dig into more and other interact things. Um, but two of the ones we use are Paper Mill and Commuter. Uh, Paper Mill is a notebook executor uh, where it executes notebooks, and Commuter is a read only interface for viewing notebooks, which are both kind of handy for this. So, what is Paper Mill? Well, it's this really simple concept. It basically is an executor, which you give it an input notebook, and you give it some parameters, and it will put those parameters in that notebook and run it and output the output to a new place. Um, you know, nothing crazy, not a lot of code even. The code base is pretty small. Um, and and how's this, how do you actually use this? You know, what, what's this actually do? Uh, and here you can do uh, paper mill. It has a CLI and an a a Python API. It's also an experimental R um, library, but it hasn't been worked on as much. So stick to the CLI or the Python one for now, or if, unless you want to contribute there. Um, and uh, paper mill, you basically give it an input path on the CLI version, and then you give it an output. And here we're using uh, this run ID. Uh, to give it a unique place to put it. So you can see here down below, this would produce outputs for each day. If we're running this once a day and our run ID has the date in it, we get a nice little execution of log of what actually happened each day on our notebook. If our notebook changed from day to day, we'll get to see those changes in the output. Um, and then the other thing you get to do is you can add parameters. And the command line, this is pretty straightforward. It basically has a couple modes you can pass them in. Um, the two common ones are dash p, which you can just give it a little uh, primitive parameter. Uh, here, in this case, we're setting the region field to be uh, Canada. And then we have this dash y. Um, and dash y uh, it can take any YAML or JSON. So if you want to express more complex objects, you can also pass those in, and they'll get translated the code. And the way these get translated is um, you have a cell in your notebook that says, this is my parameter cell. And that says, these are where all the defaults are. And then it'll inject a cell right after that. If you don't have a parameter cell tagged, it'll just put them at the top of the notebook. So it'll work with any notebook. Um, and what this will do is it'll make this cell down here at the bottom that you see, uh, where the inputs we just gave it become code that's actually in your notebook. So from your notebook's point of view, it's just code that somebody wrote. In this case, it was the library and not a human. Um, and here, we're replacing two of the three things we call default parameters up above. And now we've kind of templatized our notebook to say, hey, these are the things we might change, and here's where we change them. Um, in this case, we're sort of moving from US and checking phone and tablet data. Maybe we want to aggregate on usage in a particular way. So, um, you know, I kind of get a real, like, yeah, it's a really simple library, but there is more complexity here that's actually going on. This is like the full picture of what, what it does, um, but it really, it really does four operations. It has reading from a source, which can be configured. It's actually plug and play, so you can choose to register a new, new location to read or write notebooks. Um, so you can make this a database, a file, a service. We use S3 a lot, um, and Commuter is a target, so they're nice places where people tend to put things. Um, it injects this parameter cell that we just talked about. So it'll take these parameters and convert them into code. And this works for a few languages, and it's easy to add new languages. So today it works for uh, R, Python, and Scala, but it's really trivial. Like a new developer coming in and trying to add it, it takes like an hour or two to add a new language, um, so long as you have a kernel that you can execute against. And uh, then what it actually does when it runs is it, uh, under the hood, it's launching up a runtime manager. It then launches the kernel that's specified in the notebook. And then it sends messages back and forth from that kernel, just like a notebook server would. 
So it's following the same Jupyter protocol. It's just managing its own kernel rather than using a shared one. Um, and then finally, it outputs that notebook when it finishes computing or when it runs into an error. And each time a cell executes, it's going to write out to an output target. Um, this too can be a database file service, so you can register anything there as well. Usually we output the S3 because we want to actually have you know, immutable records we're probably not going to touch very often, so S3 is a good place. Like It's high, high availability and we know where it is and we can give it a nice uh, prefix. Um, another thing to note with the, the paper execution here is because it's running its own runtime and its own kernel, um, it doesn't have the problem of like multiple users trying to talk to the same kernel, so you can run like 20 parallel uh, paper mill processes and everything will be fine. Uh, it, won't, it won't cause a, you know, a conflict between the two talking to each other. So it simplifies the execution environment a little bit. Um, you know, with a traditional notebook server, if you're using shared notebook services, you might have a problem where you know, somebody's hogging resources or a kernel is doing something which impacts another kernel, other things like that. And here we get complete isolation. This it acts really like an independent process. So um, why is this important and why are we spending so long talking about paper mail? Well, the answer is that it really adds this concept of notebook isolation. Um, it isolates the input from the output notebook. So in fact, this gives us some reliability about mutation of the notebook, gives us uh, reliability about versioning because we can see exactly what ran at any point in time. And it lets us parameterize these notebooks so we can reuse a template rather than having to define new notebooks for every single type of work we do. Um, and also the configuring source and syncing is really helpful too because at Netflix, for example, we have some additional like internal tools that, that house notebooks in different places, and we can just register each of those with the, with the paper mill, and then when we run, we can someone give a URL. Whatever URL they were using, and we can always fetch their notebook easily and, and execute it. So it's really easy to extend to your, your particular business's use case. Cool. So that, that kind of helps us solve some of the problems that we had before we could get the scheduling. So first thing you need to do is pick a scheduler. Um, and it turns out for notebook execution, most will do. Um, can it run a container and can it, can it interpret a cron string or an event of, that you're processing? If the answer is yes to these things, you have most of the basics you need. Um, what actually ends up happening is, is that the, um, the notebook that you're executing cares a lot more about um, you know, the fact that you have the kernel there. And so if you're running in a, a container environment, which is the same container environment your developers developed in, you really don't have to do much here. Um, the thing that you actually need to spend more time on is the things your business needs out of the schedule that are unrelated to the execution. Um, and so if you see something like this, where like this is an example where we use, you know, Docker and we have time triggers and event triggers, you know, executing its Docker and they're running paper milled output a notebook. Um, and what we actually cared about is much more of these types of things. And this is where we spent a lot of our time before we got this project kind of rolling. Um, and these are things like you might care about um, you know, event-based as opposed to time-based scheduling. Um, you might care about how to control the retry pattern. Maybe in some cases you want to retry more often because you know it's a system failure instead of a user failure. Um, and also other things like identity might be really important, knowing who's executing what. Um, and these are things that different schedulers give you in different um, varieties or flavors. And so there's not really a silver bullet here we can, we can hand off. Um, if you haven't used any scheduler before, Airflow is a really good example. It's in Python, and it does most of the things you want. Um, there's definitely some things you might want to extend for your particular uh, business need. Um, so at Netflix, uh, what we ended up using internally uh, was uh, an internal sourced uh, scheduler, which already had a lot of contextual information about the Netflix platform. Um, there's been some talks about it as well. It's called Mason. Uh, it's not open source, and mostly because it's, it's really tailored for Netflix use case. And we weighed this against a few other options that were out there in the open source community. And for us, the value of having a team that was already developing it and it already had integration into things we already did uh, made it better for us to choose the in inner source. But if we'd gone the other route and gone Airflow, we just had to invest a little more time for our integration components to get to the same place. Um, and there was pretty serious discussions about should we use Airflow or um, one of the other open source uh, targets. All right, well, the next thing is even if you have a scheduler and you have these nice notebooks, if it's really hard to define when they run, you're still kind of in a situation where no one can use these easily. So one thing we want to target with the users that we described at the beginning is these users are semi-technical. They can you know, read SQL, maybe write some SQL, 
They can uh, read basic code or basic templating, but they can't, you know, develop applications or run, you know, complex command line arguments or other things that they need, might need to do in traditional schedulers. So um, we actually uh, chose to focus on using YAML as a human-friendly format, and it has a couple of advantages. Um, YAML, for one, easily translates to JSON, so if you have APIs that respect JSON, it's easy to have them interact in a codified manner. But it's also actually pretty human friendly uh, for an analyst to read this file. And we're gonna go through this file here in a second, but you know, from reading this alone, if you just saw this out of the blue, you kind of get an idea of what it's doing. Um, it has some you know, keywords at the top like trigger and workflow, um, and there's a thing called daily. You know, if you had an example of this, it, we found that it's pretty easy for uh, you know, semi-technical or non-technical users to jump in and contribute or, or make new, one, new uh, definitions. So, sorry, I have been losing my voice from talking for two days, so I'm going to drink a little bit of water here and there just to keep it going. Um, so the uh, two sections here that you know are really important, we have this trigger section that we define where we, we put a uh, cron string, you can also put an event here if you wanted, or some other way that you would trigger your workflow. And then the workflow section is really something we use to describe DAGs. If you're not familiar with DAGs, they're basically just graphs you're gonna execute. Um, so this is usually when you have a job that has depends on two other jobs and you wanna execute them in the right order. That's what a DAG is. You're basically defining the, the execution pattern. And here we, we basically just have two jobs. We actually don't show the DAG section where we define how they link together. But we have the first job here is just a notebook job. Um, and we've ID'd this thing as some user video stream that we wanna collect. Um, and we give it some path to a notebook. In this case, we're pointing to our commuter service, and we've got some notebook that we've been developing. And it's, it's sitting in this service, and we're gonna say, hey, use this notebook when you, when you trigger this workflow. And then we have an additional field in here called run date. And run date here is actually taking some scheduler name thing that I've made up called workflow activation date. Ours is less useful of a name, but the same idea. Um, and this is gonna get passed as a parameter. So everything else in this JSON document, everything, or in this YAML document, that comes in the job after the kind of required fields, uh, we just add as extra parameters that get passed directly to the paper mill as JSON arguments. So what this means is when you actually run the notebook here, you're gonna get run date as a parameter at the top of your, in your parameter cell that you can actually use in your execution. You might use this, for example, to make a query that only looks for that day's data and do something with it. So uh, what the platform then does and where, where we spend time on the tooling is then interpreting this uh, definition in YAML <laughs> and translating it to the engine's particular DAG uh, representation and then rendering that for the user. So when a user pushes this YAML definition uh, into our system, we can read it, interpret it, build them the reference of how they're gonna execute their work and let them review it and you know, play around with it before it actually goes into a real schedule. So, um, we're going to start digging into what, what's the advantages of, of doing this with notebooks. Like everything we just described, you know, we're scheduling things. Like notebooks really haven't come into it. You're just scheduling work. And we've talked about notebooks being able to be scheduled, but why would you use a notebook? Um, and really the answer is here is that your inputs and your outputs are the same. They look the same. They have the same debug interaction. And it's the same way you would debug a local context. So. If you're working in a notebook server, or you're developing code there, you're gonna debug it the same way you're gonna debug in the scheduler now. You're gonna work in the same type of execution context. You're gonna load that notebook and you're gonna fiddle with it until you figure out why it was broken or how to fix it. So say we take that definition that we showed earlier and we say, well, one of these jobs failed in our, in our DAG, so the, the whole workflow didn't finish executing. We've processed a few countries' data, but we didn't, France broke for some reason. So um, in this case, you know, we would go and look at, well, what happened in this job? We'd go to the job and it would say, here's the output notebook for this run. You can click on it and go look at what actually executed. We have a read-only interface, so you know you won't accidentally change the output. Um, and this reads much like you would read you know, output logs. But the nice thing is the code is right next to the output. So if I want to see how, you know, which output goes with which code, it's a lot clearer. Um, you can also see helpful statements that are printed in context. So like here we print out the script that this template is actually trying to run. So it's trying to create this table for this day um, and uh, put some data in it. And at the end of it, we, you know, we have like this is the execute and where it's actually waiting. 
And so you can make these like nice little short templates that give you a lot of contextual information without being you know this horrible 10 page manual you have to read and it still adds a lot of value. So in debugging this, um, you know the thing we would do, like I said, is how you debug a normal notebook. You would go load the notebook. You would go find the issue. We see here that you know we've removed the stack trace, but you'd have a nice stack trace. And here we have something where um, it tried to connect to a genie service, which is an execution um, arbiter, um, and it said it couldn't find the host genie.typo, uh, which probably means we have a mistake somewhere either in our library or in our notebook. Um, and in this case, if you go load that into your notebook server and actually fiddle with it, uh, you would quickly find something like, well, someone changed the source code while we were executing, and this job caught the new version, and the new version requires you specify the host, and if it doesn't have it, it doesn't know where the real host is. So, cool, we can fix that pretty quickly. We just add this dot host cluster host name, um, and then we try rerunning it right there, and we can actually run this with the exact parameterization that failed. So that's another really interesting attribute of this. You don't have to go in and recreate the execution context and the execution environment. You just take the output notebook and you run it exactly as is and you keep changing it so you fix it. And what it means is your parameters are already set. So your run date, um, your particular specialization for the field, your queries, all those things are fixed. Um, which means when you're debugging, you're debugging exactly what failed as opposed to debugging something like what failed. Um, in some cases, you do have to, you know, change some things substantially to like uh, remove side effects that you don't want to have happen. But in the majority of cases, this is a really handy way to find out what went wrong and know that you're actually fixing the issue and that the next execution is likely to work. All right, so given that have we done this, like we've relied on a few things about how we're integrating with notebooks that we haven't really talked about yet. Um, in particular, I won't, can't emphasize this enough because I think it's something that has slowly grown to be uh, a, um, a best practice with notebooks, is that notebooks are not libraries, so don't try to treat them like one. Um, what notebooks are, are they're really good integration tools. They have great ways of accessing lots of things, bringing them together, giving you nice visuals and nice collections of outputs. Um, and this means that if you treat notebooks as an integration tool, you're going to have more success with knowing that they're going to reliably execute. If you try and treat them like a library, we have lots and lots of little code snippets and different functions and lots of branching conditions. Um, you're going to get a lot of complexity and you're going to have uh, a lack of reliability in knowing that your notebook is going to work when you actually schedule it. Because you may have tested on branch one, but when it executes, it's going to execute on branch three and five, uh, which can be a real problem. It makes it hard to debug. It also makes it hard for other people to come help you when it fails. Um, so if you need multiple people to be able to support the system, having complex notebooks will lead to, lead to problems. So um, this gives us a few sort of guiding principles we like to go through. And we try to emphasize these at, at Netflix, in particular when people are uh, bringing a template they want to share with other people. One is keep a low branching factor. If you have lots of if statements and conditionals in your code, um, you probably are gonna have a hard time you know, making tests that cover all those cases, or it may be difficult when you change those if conditions to know that you're still covering them. Uh, short and simple is better. Um, our best templates can fit in one page. Um, you have one page that describes what you're doing, and if there's lots of complexity, um, you, know, you should probably move that out of the notebook. Uh, and in particular, this kind of leads to your notebook should keep to one simple outcome. You're trying to have a notebook do one thing, so do it well. If you need to do multiple things, you could either have multiple notebooks, or you maybe need a library that encapsulates the higher level constructs. And this is where the, the, the kind of biggest point is here. Is, like, naturally, when you're developing a notebook, it slowly grows over time as you add features, as you think about new things you want to do. Um, and that's OK. And we're not saying don't do that. What we're saying is when you notice that something important is now like 10 pages long and has more functions than uh, you can remember how the name, at that point, you might want to think about moving this code into a shared library. And if you're, um, if you're using good development practice and you actually check these notebooks directly in the Git or some other version control, um, you actually have a place right there where you can do your libraries in parallel to your uh, notebooks to, to unit test the complex pieces and then use them as an, in the integration of the notebook. That way you can still have the same execution pattern, but you get a little bit better guarantees about your execution being successful. And the parts that need really careful testing, you can do it without having to tear apart your notebook to, to make that happen. All right, so that actually leads to the next thing is, well, if you do these things and you keep narrow notebooks, which by the way, we are victim of, of not doing well there occasionally, so it's definitely something that's always a work in progress, like all good development patterns. 
But if you do follow this, you can actually make some very uh, strong claims of just doing simple paper mill executions just like you're going to do in your scheduler. So if we have a linear notebook and it's doing a very simple thing, um, it's pretty easy for us to give it dummy inputs, run through and ensure that it actually executes all the code as you would expect. And if there's not too many branches, you have a pretty good reasonable assertion that this is going to function when you actually schedule it. So we use this extensively at Netflix. Um, we've built a kind of swath of these type of tests, but we actually write them like this, which is why not write a schedule that looks just like what a user is going to schedule? It also just runs paper mill under the hood, but you're also testing that the, that the environment it's executing is going to be the same as the user, and you're testing a few other things like you know, the way users pass information through the YAML is also being tested. So in this case, what we're really doing is making a suite of integration tests, and this actually gives us coverage in the places we've never had coverage before. Um, in particular, like we have a lot of dependent systems that have grown naturally over time. Not all of those have had the dedicated time that they needed to have proper and good testing. So there's a lot of like loving care put into making sure those things run. Um, but now with this integration suite is we're running all these notebooks that are very simple and making every template and every published notebook have these uh, scheduled tests. We're actually catching issues in our integration tests well before um, other people even know their system is down. Um, and the thing is, like you described this, it actually looks much like what a user is going to run themselves. In this case, we use this type called Spark Notebooks. We made a special template, we called it Spark Notebook. And we actually use a uh, script here, so we're passing in the PySpark script as, a, as an external dependency. Uh, but here, we, you know, we picked like a region called Luna, which shouldn't have any real user data because it's, no one lives there. And uh, yeah. so. That type of testing is, is, is kind of handy and been really useful for us in making sure that we know the schedule is going to work for our users, and we've had a lot of success at it. Um, and so what we're really kind of accumulating to is we're trying to commit very hard to this notebook space, um, but we are still exploring. There's lots of things we still want to do better. There's lots of places we want to keep innovating and, and help contribute back to the open source community. Um, and here's a few of the, the particulars that we're actually trying to still solve better. Some of these are solved in, in you know, subsets of the community, but not everywhere. Um, one thing we really want to make easy is sharing notebooks. Today at Netflix, like, there's enough tools and different systems people use that it's difficult for them to know uh, how to easily get a notebook from system A to system B. So we want to make that really simple and build it right into the interfaces, or make them not even know there is two different systems of the same interface. Um, and then, as always, since we're targeting users that are less technical and we're using tools that are more modern on terms of uh, development and look and feel, we always want to be building better interfaces so there's not an impedance mismatch on the interface preventing a user from doing their job. Um, and then, you know, reviewing notebooks, if you've ever tried to look at a diff of a notebook, it's a fun time. Um, and you either learn to like read between the matrix lines and see the girl in the in the code, or you um, <laughs> or you download the notebook and don't look at it and get. Um, so there's some tools there that that are present to help. Like MB Dime is a really good uh, good solution, but it isn't integrated with all Git tooling. And uh, so there's some places where we want to improve and add more capability. Um, and then the last thing we want to kind of leave here is we really want to integrate more notebook technologies. You know, we're using a bunch of Interact libraries, we're using you know, Jupyter Protocol, we're trying to commit back to those different open source communities. Um, but there's also lots of other really cool tools that we just haven't had time or um, haven't had the, you know, seen a really neat implementation to be able to pull in and give our users more value. All right, so that pretty much wraps up how you schedule notebooks. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we do have a uh, a few more sessions from Netflix that talk more about some of the tools that I referenced here. Um, and we have a, a few blog posts in our tech blog that talk more in a, a little bit of the same topics, but a little bit different skew on, on how we approach the uh, problems. Yeah, I want to leave a little time here so we have time for questions. And uh, I'll be available outside afterwards, too, um, when the next start stocks, so if anyone wants to ask for it. Great. No, thank you. Yeah, so the question, just so everyone can hear, um, was if you, how do you kind of, you're talking about diffing of notebooks, how do you uh, reconcile when you have, you know, a year's worth of executions, what minor differences happened and how they affected the outcomes? Um, the answer to that is, 
Uh, what we end up doing is we try to like isolate all of our notebooks and runs and collect them in a the UI. So in our UI, we have like a visualization for each day, what succeeded and what failed for each job that ran. And for each of those success and failures, you have all the retry attempts with a notebook link for every single one of them. So one thing that's really easy is if you see a failure sporadically and you don't understand the failure when you read it, you can look at the notebook right before it or the notebook right after it to find out what changed. Um, and that's worked out pretty well. Yes, yeah, so the question was around like when you have complex problems like Spark jobs where you have lazy evaluation and like little differences in terms of how the user represents the job they're trying to do could cause uh, you know unexpected delays or failures. Um, I believe that's basically what you're asking. Um, yeah, so that's actually even is going beyond a little bit. Like we actually support some kernels that run PySpark in the notebook, so we have some tooling where we've plugged under the hood so it can talk to our, our clusters. And there the users can kind of do their iteration on there. But oftentimes what happens there is that the user usually over utilizes resources or takes too long to run the job and they hit their own defined timeout, so their own defined resource constraints. And then what they'll usually do is if they don't understand why, they'll come ask our support channel. And it's really easy for us to tell because we can go to the notebook, read what they did, see exactly how they executed, and give them recommendations for how to remediate. And actually, we've been building some tools internally that we haven't talked about too much because they're really crude right now on being able to automatically try and classify some of these errors and give a hint to the user and to the debugger right away about why it failed and what, what you might take to fix it. Um, but really, that just makes it easier for our support process to support because the notebook is right there and they only have one interface to ever look at. Um, yeah, the question was, have we worked on anything that lets multiple users edit the same notebook? Um, the answer is, yes, we're working on it. No, we don't have something that is like ready or available yet. Uh, we do really want to help solve that problem, and we don't want to just solve it for Netflix. Um, this is definitely a place where um, uh, there's challenges in how the infrastructure of Jupyter works in particular uh, to solve this well. Um, and it's not anything like poorly designed, just wasn't thought through for this use case originally. So there's definitely some work there, but it requires some rethinking about how you execute Jupyter Notebooks, in particular where you house the state. So we might, you might see that coming in the uh, Interact libraries for something where we have a notebook where the state is held in the back end instead of the front end, and then we can do that better. Uh, but yeah, no, there's a lot of interesting thoughts in that space, and uh, we'd love to hear if you have opinions on it later. Yeah, something, so the question was, you know, how do you handle complex dependencies? In particular, if you're using Docker, that's a barrier to entry for novice users to be able to get the dependencies that need installed. And Netflix actually has a, an interesting take on this. We actually have several people that dedicate most of their day or, or all their time into making a shared image which has all the common dependencies that Netflix uses and making sure that they run successfully before they promote each day that image. So what we do is we set the image that your notebook server is running in, and it's the same image that your development server is in, and the same image that we're scheduling on. So what it means is no matter where you're running the notebook, you're gonna have the same dependencies available. And it covers like 98% of the dependencies. So the few that are left, we either A, say, hey, if you're really doing something that's one-off, do a pip install in your notebook, that's okay. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Or, um, if you, you know, if it's too complex to do that, come talk to us and then we add it into the image for them and then they get that dependency. Um, that's worked out pretty well. It is a little bit of abuse of the Docker like ideology, but it's actually been very beneficial with this wide set of users and making sure they're all using the same technology. The question was, can you use Papermill to hydrate a notebook without actually running it? The answer is yes, there's a dash dash I originally called it dry run, we renamed it, so now I'm forgetting the other name, but yeah, there's an option in there to do exactly that.
Yeah, so the question was how do you deal with identity and authorization in your notebook execution? That actually ends up being one of the scheduler secondary attributes I was talking about, one of the bullets was identity. Um, that really has to be handled by something that's given to your executing context, and that sometimes has to abuse environment variables that we do ask you to pass it in as a parameter when we execute so that if you move it someplace else and run it, uh, we know like what's happening and it tries to reconcile the identity. Uh, but it's not a perfectly solved problem at Netflix. Uh, but we do have basically um, the scheduler when it runs, it deploys a container on an open source service called Titus that we uh, open sourced. And that, that does the authorization for um, <laughs> like who's acting as the runner for this notebook. Yes. Yeah, the question was, do we own our own pip servers for open source repositories? We do have our own pip servers, but they're mostly a cache proxy layer to the real PyPy servers. Um, we have a few things in there that are Netflix specific that we put in there, so we don't have to talk to Artifactory because that's a fun Java world you don't need in Python. <laughs> Oh, how do you take care when an open source library breaks your image? Yeah, so we try to do a few things to prevent that. One is that's why these people are spending like all day trying to make sure this image is right. Because they, when there are packages and upgraded, they need to keep an eye on things. And what we actually do is we promote to the test environment. So all our integration tests actually run against the canary image that's about the release instead of the um, actual image. I think I'll wrap up. Um, and then the um, other thing that we do is we actually run 10% of our jobs in production, run the canary image first. They try once with the canary. And so if we see failures when an image, new image comes along and they're like related failures, we'll roll back that image before it goes out. Occasionally it still goes out and breaks things, then we just try an emergency deploy a new image. Yeah, it does happen occasionally. It's a hard problem. All right, so that's all the time we have for questions, but I'll be outside if you, any of you want to uh, come chat for a little bit. Awesome, thank you.